Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Good to be here. Another week by. I tell you what, we have entered the season of green. I made the mistake of washing my black truck this week to go out the next morning to green truck. If you are full of allergies, sorry. <laughs> Better start taking the meds now because uh, it is out there. But it is not in here. We have nice filters in our, <laughs> in our AC units, so this is a little protection. But however, I do very thankful you're here, very thankful you're home joining us. Take the time, settle in, rest your heart, rest your mind, rest your soul. We are here to worship the King. Amen is right. Let's go to the Word. Hear, O Lord, and be, be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that you take our, our difficult times and our hard times, Lord God, yes, and you can turn them to joy. You can take us, Lord God, to your, your sanctuary, to a place of safety. I pray for each person that may be going through that time that you would touch them now, Lord God, that you would bless them with your spirit, Jesus. that you would give, give them a time of joy, that they can push that aside, Lord God, and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What a privilege it is mm -hmm. to worship you. Bless our hearts, Lord God, as we raise our voices. Mm -hmm. May we do so in adoration to you. Bless the worship team as they lead us. We thank you for the time of prayer. We ask that you would touch the message that Jerry has prepared for us, Lord God. May it enter our hearts and our minds, Lord God, and not just fall on the hard place, but Lord God, help us to change, to make a change in us and to change in those around us. We thank you for who you are, for what you will do in this place today. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You're invited to sing. I think we're the place to keep your mask on. You can sing with us this morning.
Okay, good morning, good morning. How are you? So glad that you chose to worship here today. Those of you online, thank you for being with us. A joy to have you join us in that way and those of you here in the sanctuary. And we know that God is always here wherever we are because he is everywhere, amen? amen. It's our prayer time. What a joy to be able to lift our voices to God in prayer. I hope that you will take advantage, that's kind of a bad word, I guess. I hope you'll enter into prayer time with your prayer needs. This isn't Pastor Jerry's prayer time. This is our time to enter God's presence. We received an online request for a lady named Gladys Eunice. Asked that we pray for her. She's an elderly lady going through some physical problems. I want to keep praying for our brother Fred, still dealing with the residual stuffs of his um, wonderful trip to Florida. 
not so wonderful trip to Florida, so pray for Fred to be fully recovered. Continue to pray for your church in this time of transition and for our search committee as they do their work and for your pastor that he will not be anxious and worried. Amen. <laughs> I invite you, if you are able to stand as we pray together, let's enter the, God's, the presence of the Lord, God's presence. Let's ask him to touch our hearts this morning. Our Father, as we come to you, we're asking that our hearts would be open to you in a newly expectant way. What a year, Lord, we have come through, each one of us dealing with our own things, some of us with loss, a few of us with death, many of us, Lord, with questions. We thank you that we can come to you and know that you are the rock eternal, the hope of all the ages of every person who will trust in you. Raise our faith, Lord, I pray, until it can move mountains. We do pray for those two that we have mentioned this morning, and I know there are others, Lord, asking that you would touch their lives and you would bring healing. We pray as we do often, Jesus, that faith discovery would continue to fulfill her mission in this community to make a measurable difference for your kingdom, touching lives, feeding, Lord, the hungry, directing kids in our youth center downtown, letting people know the presence of God in worship and in our daily outreach. And Lord, we thank you for your spirit at work in our lives. Empower us, Lord. Make us hungry, I pray again, to know the powerful presence of the Spirit of God on a daily, even hourly basis. Lord, as we continue in this worship service, as Gary's already prayed, we ask for the anointing of your spirit in your word that we would hear, Lord, the truth of God, and respond with hearts of faith. All this, Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, would you join me in our confession of faith? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead, The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in Christ's universal church, the communion of all believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And I am a Christian. Praise God. Sing with me. Lift your voices and adore him as we sing. Praise God from whom. Blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above the heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy or two people, give them a wave. If you're comfortable, give them a fist bump, maybe even shake their hand now that we're sort of getting vaccinated. We will be resuming, God willing, our anointing in person probably on the first Sunday of June. I'm so excited to get back to that opportunity to pray with people who want to be prayed for. Um, So we will be bringing that back. Thank you for being here today. Continue to pray that people will be able to feel confident to be in worship. Amen? Amen? All right. Good morning again. It is good to see you. Awana is meeting today at 4 o'clock. We have about four weeks, I think four weeks until we're done. So if your children are part of Awana or would like to just come and see what it's about, they're welcome at 4 o'clock. Earn those last dollars before we get to our store night and our awards night at the end of the year. And youth as well is meeting at 4. And I think Gary needs some information about going on camp, doing stuff so if you're doing stuff so make some decisions about your kids going to camp so he can make those decisions um, with the group pastor jerry is starting a new series on wednesday evenings for bible study um Mm -hmm. that's right right 
Looking forward to it. Okay, he's looking forward to it. Um, on Ephesians, surprise, surprise. So um, being that's his favorite book, it must be a wonderful study to be at. So you are invited <laughs> on Wednesday evenings at 7 right here in the cafe to Bible study. Rocky Railway is chugging along. Within the next week or so, you'll be seeing a donation um, bulletin board as we do um, every year. So you can donate things to this cause. But July 5th through 9th, we will be here in person. So if your kids would like to be part of that, if you'd like to volunteer, um, see me, see the website to make that happen. And we're still looking for someone to fill our part-time administrative assistant role. Mm -hmm. um, you can see Pastor Jerry if that's something that you're familiar with, things like QuickBooks and um, doing some media online, that kind of thing, um, and certainly strong um, word skills. Um, so see Pastor Jerry if you're interested in that. And before we thank you for your giving and um, encourage you in that way, I'm going to invite Tom Edmonds to come up and talk about... Um, some things, some opportunities for you. Laura, there is a slide. If oh, there's a it. slide. There you go. Thank okay, you. so we do thank you for your giving, and now there's an <laughs> official slide for Tom. <laughs> so come on up. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Good morning Amen. to those of you who are at home. Please don't go get your coffee refilled now, but stick around for this <laughs> announcement. As you may recall, in late 2019, we revised our constitution and our bylaws in terms of how members of the board of deacons are selected. The intention is to allow for more input from you, the congregation at large. Active members of FDC will take part in the nominating process for our next class of deacons. So today I'm announcing the formation of a nominating committee which will recommend candidates to fill the openings on the Board of Deacons for the next three-year term beginning on September 1st of this year. The committee will consist of one elder, one deacon, and two members from the congregation at large. Pastor Jerry will appoint the elder and the deacon, and members from the congregation must be active members in good standing here at Faith Discovery. And for those members at large, we need your input. If you're willing yourself to serve on this nominating committee, you may simply submit your name to Pastor Jerry or any elder by May 16th, which is two weeks from today. You may also nominate someone else as long as you have their written permission to do so. The elders and pastor will notify the members at large who have been selected to serve on the nominating committee. The elder on the committee will call the first meeting. If you have any questions about that, I'll hang around in the cafe after the service. Otherwise, thank you. I hope you'll make this a matter of prayer and send in your suggestions. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Let's worship. Over empty space Said let there be light To a dark and formless world Your light was born You spread out your arms Over empty hearts Said let there be light To a dark and
So last week I began, oh, children, you may be dismissed. Sorry, I almost forgot about that. Children, you may be dismissed to Children's Church if you are ready to go through the cafe and up the stairs. We're glad that you're able to join in Children's Church. Last week I started, a, or two weeks ago, I started a series of messages about being transformed, having a life that is touched and changed by the power of Jesus. Last week talked about the transformed mind. Today, <laughs> I want to talk to you about transformed emotions. Wow. How many of you occasionally experience some messy emotions? Very good. The rest of you aren't telling the truth probably. Yeah. Emotions are great some of the time. We feel enjoyment. We feel love. We feel peace. We, but we also feel sadness, disgust, pain, anger, long list. We get confused by our emotions sometimes, don't we? Now, everybody relax. I was talking with Teresa before the service. And she said, well, this pastor, pastor, this sounds like a psychological sermon, not a spiritual one. It, it's going to be a little psychological to start, but it will get to Christian truth, okay? So hang in there. I am not Dr. Phil. Make no claims to be Dr. Phil. I'm not, not going to do that. <laughs> and I'm certainly not going to do Oprah. All right, there we go. But we're going to talk a little bit about emotions this morning. We're going to talk about how to deal with those messy emotions. We're going to talk about orienting those things as God would have us to orient them because sometimes we find it a little difficult to understand. Like, for example, when does anger cross the line? And it's no longer a, a good thing. Anger is a good thing, by the way, in case you don't know that. If you were incapable of getting angry, you would be basically worthless in this world we need to get fired up about certain things so we'll take action so we'll demand action so we'll respond we know that but 
When does it cross the line? We all know that it can. When does stress go from being a good thing that makes us rise to an occasion as it is designed to do and becomes instead a debilitary, debilitating, weakening kind of thing because our engine just keeps revving and never settles down? Of course, none of you have that problem. That's only mine, right? Oh, Chris is going to acknowledge that too. Okay, that's good. So we're going to talk about emotions this morning, perfectly talking about emotions that can be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. A couple of recognitions to make. First of all, as I've already mentioned, emotions are good. God has emotions. You read through the Bible and you find a lot of emotion. You find that God feels joy, that he feels grief, he feels pain. He even feels hatred towards sin. Yes, absolutely. He gets frustrated with his people. Read through the Old Testament. You, you find that hard to believe. You just read the Old Testament and you find that God becomes deeply frustrated that his people don't respond to him. God has emotions. God made you in his image. You have emotions. They can be and are good things. I'm glad you have emotions. They are a gift of God. Emotions e- enrich us. It might not always seem that way, but if you don't have emotions, you're a robot. And who likes dealing with a robot? I'm glad robots build my car, but I wouldn't want to live with a robot, okay? I'm really thankful for Alexa in my house. How many of you have Alexa? Isn't she friendly? Not really. Alexa's a mechanical voice, okay? Every morning I wake up to Alexa telling me it's time to get up, and I say, Alexa, good morning. And Alexa responds by turning on my lights, playing Christian music, and saying, hello, Jerry. But that, yeah, it's for true, Tony. <laughs> but he, Alexa's a, a robot, you know, and I'm glad that that's not the only relationship I have because that, that would be a pretty empty relationship. Yeah, we need emotions. They're a gift of God. Emotions, though, <clears throat> can become unhealthy when they get carried to an extreme. You do know that. Yes, they can. There's a couple of extremes. Well, we're told that or some of us go to the extreme of emotionalism. All, whatever I feel, that's what matters. You know, it's, It doesn't matter what's right or what's wrong or what's popular or unpopular or what's good or what's bad. All that matters is what I feel in this moment. All of my life is based on emotionalism. You know how a person lives who's in emotionalism? Oh, big swings, wide swings in life. They're up today, they're in the pits tomorrow. If you've ever had to deal with a person whose emotions are in control of my life, who are dominated by their emotions, you know how exhausting that can be. And God's people said? Okay, good. But the next one is something called stoicism. Emotions are of little value, don't need those emotions, get rid of them, you know, wipe them out. Well, that's not great either. People tend to live with one extreme or the other. Some people live with their emotions repressed. We'll just call them stuffers. Can you say that word with me? Stuffers. Okay? I'm not going to ask you who does that, but some people do. They're repressed. Other people are indiscriminate expressors. We call those gushers. Say that with me. Gusher. Okay? If a stuffer lives with a gusher, that's a problem. Right? Right? Right, it is. That's absolutely true. But people who are spiritually mature, people who are emotionally mature, know that there's a time to feel, to be enriched by those emotions, and there's a time to override what you're feeling so you can get on with life, so you can make the hard choices that you need to make. Some Christians live their spiritual life very much in this way. They live their life, some live their life as a stuffer. They don't want or desire or believe it's necessary to have an emotional experience of God. Probably, if you have been part of the evangelical church for as long as I have, you were taught something in your discipleship about the order of things. Faith, fact, feeling. How many of you ever heard that little line? You know? And sometimes it was illustrated, and I'm really revealing my age now. It was revealed with a train. The engine was faith, and the car was fact, and the caboose was feelings. You know? A train, as far as I know, and I'm not a train guy. I probably should have checked with Nate before I started. But a train can run without a caboose, as far as I know. 
Can't run without an engine. So that's kind of a faulty thing. Oh, it's true as far as it goes. Faith does come first. The fact of God's word needs to overpower the fickleness of our emotions, but we can't say that emotions are as unnecessary as a caboose or we're going to miss out a great deal of what it means to be a Christian because God wants to relate to you. Amen? God wants to love you. God wants you to love him in return. God wants you to engage with him with your heart and soul and mind and strength. So we need to be be careful to say, well, we don't need emotions at all. But other Christians go to the other extreme. The gushers, they say, ah, emotions are all that matter. If I go to church, I want an ocean of emotion. (laughs) You know? I want the songs to move me. I want to leap and dance and jump and cry. I, I don't mind that every now and then. You know, we could use a little leaping and dancing to be perfectly frank. Yeah. But if all of our relationship with God is, Lord, stir my emotions, make me cry, make me laugh, we're going to miss out on sound and solid doctrine. We're going to miss out on that, those anchor points of faith that are so critically important. And most of all, we will probably risk being led astray or manipulated. I believe that one of the reasons so many Christians go off the rail is because they primarily relate to God out of the heart instead of their head. So somebody comes and appeals to their heart and tells them a sad story, and off they go down the trail with them because they don't have the truth in their head to be able to correct it. So we need transformed emotions. We need to manage those emotions. Why do we need to manage those emotions? Well, number one, they're unreliable. They really are. Emotions are great, but they are unreliable. How many of you have ever said, you know, I just know this is the right thing to do. I feel it in my gut. And then three months later, you have a gut ache right? (laughs) It just didn't work. So somehow that emotion was wrong. Proverbs 14, 12 says this way, there's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end it leads to death. So our emotions can be unreliable. They can be, as I've already alluded to, manipulated. If you don't control your emotions, they'll control you. If you're guided by your feelings, other people will take advantage of you. You ever hear of impulse buying? I'm a Facebooker, you know that, right? I'm the Facebook ninja around here. But in my, because I use Facebook so much, they pop these things up in my feed that says shop now. I've clicked on a few of those. I have a few doodads in my house that I impulse bought as I was streaming. I said, oh, that looks like a cool thing. Boom. And it's just too easy because the credit card's linked, you know? How many of you know about that? Okay, a couple of you. The rest of you won't admit it. How many of you shop in ShopRite and you come to the end of the row and they have that really beautiful display of high profit items? You know why they're there? Because that's impulse buying. I've been told that they put those things at the end of the row when you're swinging the cart around because you're much more likely that when you're looking for the tomato brand you always buy, you're going to select that. But at the end of the row, nothing there. Oh, I, oh look at that display. Oh, I need five of those. It's called impulse buying. It happens. Of course, charities will play on your emotions too. Those cute kids with the St. Jude's commercials, how many of you have had your heart touched by those? And then there's a song, some of you are going to be offended, so that's all right. I'm old and sensitive. Those, <laughs> those ASPCA ads that play that really mournful music while they, play, they show your pictures of really, really sad dogs in terrible situations, then what, why do they do that? Why don't they show you a beautiful collie bounding through a sunny meadow? Because they want you to give. They want to touch your heart. They want to stir you. Well, that's the problem. Here's the deal with the manipulation even more serious than this. Satan, if you're in the control of your emotions, will manipulate your emotions, and he will use fear to beat you up. He will use resentment and jealousy to paralyze you and separate you from other people. He'll use bitterness and worry and anxiety and shame to draw you away from the presence of God. So why manage those emotions? Because... They, lead to, they can lead you to be manipulated. It's interesting to me that Peter, we know Peter in the Gospels as a very emotional guy, don't we? Yeah, he's the most emotionally impulsive guy in the Gospels. And yet Peter, later on, after he has matured and he's teaching, he says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be self-controlled and alert. 
Be self-controlled and alert. Why? He said, because you have an enemy called the devil who's prowling around looking for someone to devour. And one of the ways he does that is through unregulated and unmanaged emotions. We also need to manage our emotions, quite honestly, because they can bring failure. I've already alluded to that. But we know that. You know, there are some people, unlike me, who don't like getting up in the morning. I I generally really like getting up in the morning, but some people, they hear the alarm and they let their emotions rule and they turn the alarm off and they roll over and they just don't go to work that day. If you don't do that for several days, what happens to your job? It goes away. (laughs) Unregulated emotions. I don't feel like exercising. Well, if that emotion is allowed to overrule, what are you going to do? Probably you're going to get old and have more health problems. Yeah. I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like paying my bills. I don't feel like dealing with my spouse right now because they're just difficult. I don't feel. If that's how you live, you're going to ultimately be led to failure. Proverbs again says this in Proverbs 5.23, He will die for lack of discipline, be led astray by his own great folly. But Peter was inspired to write this to us. You must live your earthly lives controlled by God's will and not by human desires. First Peter chapter 4 verse 12. You must live your earthly lives controlled by God's will and not by human desires. So how do we manage those emotions? Let's start with your part. You do have a part to play in this. And I'm so thankful as Christians it's not all coming from me, right? I'm so thankful this is a partnership with God's Spirit and me doing this. But your part is to to get in touch with what's going on. One of the questions you need to ask yourself when you're having an emotional tempest in your life is, what's the real reason I'm feeling this way? Emotions love to play hide-and-seek. You know that, right? Yeah. They pop, something starts it here and they pop out over here. And we don't always understand, why are we feeling this? Why are we going through this emotion? I'll illustrate from my life. A couple of weeks ago, there was a brewing irritability. I was just feeling aggravated about the least problems that came my way in a way that I knew was all out of proportion to what I was actually experiencing. Why am I feeling this anger? Why am I feeling this irritability? Why am I just generally upset? So I took some time to do some soul searching. I got alone with God and I said, Lord, what in the world is going on in my life? Help me to understand. And some of you are going to look at me when I tell you what was going on. You're going to say, really? You are dense, Pastor. But what I figured out was that stepping aside from this pastoral role at FDC, my pending retirement, had me, you know, like worried, anxious. You know, will the next guy love these people like I love them or will he be a moron? (laughs) That's a spiritual word, okay? But no, was that from Jesus? No, that wasn't from Jesus. That was from Jerry, but I was getting anxious about that. And then a much more selfish kind of thing was, what's next for you? You know, are you, are you going to be able to step aside from this role? You've been a pastor for 40 plus years. You know, the only way you know most people is as a pastor. You relate to them through your identity as a pastor. Are you, are you going to be able to thrive and survive when you're no longer Pastor Jerry? You're just, you know, Jerry. Ordinary dude. (laughs) I am an ordinary dude. You know that already. But so I realized, ah, I'm all torn up about this deal and I'm feeling anxious and worried. And guess what? It's going over like this and it's popping out as irritability and anger. So what I do, I took it to Christ and I committed it to him for the hundredth time, that process that we're living through together during 2021. So look deeper than the surface. What's the real reason? Another thing to ask yourself, you're going to deal with those emotions, manage them in a Christ-honoring way, is you need to ask yourself, is this true? Is what I'm feeling a reflection of the truth? You remember the story of Elijah, right? Elijah, was Elijah a great man of God? Yes. Many miracles, in touch with the Spirit of God, influential. He dealt with with Israel in a time when the king was a pagan, 
far from God, when the queen loved the idols, the, uh, rather the false gods of the Baals, the fertility gods of the region. And Elijah was in a constant conflict. But one day, God spoke to Elijah and said, it's time to bring this thing to a head. They went to Mount Carmel. Remember, under God's direction, God said to the 400 prophets of Baal, you build an altar, you put your sacrifice on your altar, I'll build an altar, put my sacrifice on the altar, then we'll pray to God, and you pray to your gods, and the God who answers with fire from heaven, he is the true God. And what did God do? You need to learn the Old Testament. God sent fire from heaven, burned up not only the sacrifice, but the altar and the dirt around the altar. That was one gigantic bolt of lightning. God answered prayer. Now, how many of you think you'd come out of an experience saying, Whoa, yeah, baby! Well, the Bible says that the queen sent a, me- uh, sent a message to Elijah and said, Elijah, you're a dead man. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. She says, I'm not going to take this easily. You're a dead man. And Elijah, because of exhaustion, ran off into the wilderness by himself, fell into a deep depression, and said, God, nobody else is left in this country that loves you, only me, full of self-pity. And then he prayed the ultimate prayer of resignation. I just want to die. I just want to die. And God said, you old fool, go ahead, just die then. No. That's what we might say. But God says, Elijah, that's not the truth. Your emotions are obscuring the truth in your life. The truth is I have 7,000 people in this country who haven't bowed the knee to these false gods. And they're looking for your leadership. Go find Elisha, join teams with him, and get on with it. And he did. Elijah was tired. He was fatigued. His perceptions, his emotions were overwhelmed. So ask yourself, is it true? Is it true? And then just frankly do a reality check. Sometimes it's really good to bring somebody else in your life, especially when emotions are raging and out of control. You say, I just got to change this. I got to quit this job. I got to leave my spouse. I can't take this anymore. I, I don't know what's going on in my life. Everything is wrong. Everything is upside down. It's a real good time to find someone who knows Jesus really well and who is mature, who can let you vent and then say to you, you need a reality check. You need to understand what is going on. Is it true? Yes. What's the real thing? What's the reality check? So what does God do to transform those emotions? Well, one of the things that God promises is he will give us a brand new heart. Aren't you excited about that? Aren't you glad for that? Have you claimed that new heart that God offered you, believer? Here's what we read in Ezekiel, the 11th chapter. God speaking to the ancient people of Judah who'd been carried away by their sins. And he didn't say, you're done forever, I'm done with you, you're erased, you're forgotten. He said, if you'll come back to me, I'll restore you. I'll quote to you, Ezekiel chapter 11. I will give them an undivided heart. I'll put them back together. And I'll put a new spirit in them. And I will remove, listen to this, he's talking right about emotions. I'll remove that heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And then they will follow my decrees and they will be careful to keep my laws and they will be my people and I will be their God. I particularly like that right in the center. Those emotions that have been deadened by fatigue or disappointment or failure or sin, he said, I will Remove those things if you turn to me, and I will give you back a soft, responsive, warm place of emotions in your life. Believer, we do well to present ourselves honestly to God. If you're concealing certain emotions because you say, well, that's not a godly emotion. If you're concealing that from God, you're making a huge mistake because let me clue you into something. He already knows. He already knows. And so we make that confession. We go to him honestly. We say, Lord, this is where I am. This is what I need. We ask for the work of the Holy Spirit. And he says, yes, I will give you a heart of flesh. I will restore to you the ability to respond to me. That's why Peter again, and I keep going back to Peter because he's such a lesson in growing up emotionally. In 1 Peter chapter 1 says this, prepare your minds for action. How do you do that? Be 
self-controlled. Gain a grip of those emotions that are manipulating you. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you. Understand where your faith needs to be. It's not just in this moment. It's in the hope that Christ gives you when he is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you once lived in when you lived in ignorance of the living God. True change in our emotions is an inside-out work. Would you say those three words with me? Inside-out work. This is not a matter of screwing down your own self-discipline. This is not a matter of saying, I will do this if it kills me. This is a matter of presenting it to God, dying to self, and seeing the renewal of the Holy Spirit from the inside out as we allow the Holy Spirit to do his work of recreation. Amen? Philippians 2.5 says this, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. The true measure of your emotions is not, well, it really feels good. The true measure of emotions is Jesus. Am I living like Jesus? Am I fully reliant on my Father in faith like Jesus was? Am I hopeful and obedient to the will of God as Jesus was? That's the true measure. You can justify almost any emotion if you want to evaluate it from a human perspective. People do it all the time when they talk to me about needs in their life. You know, I say to somebody, wow, you are in the grip of fear as we talk together. And they say, well, of course I am. Who wouldn't be in this situation? Or we talk, and I hate her, they tell me. Yeah, people do get that honest with me. And I say, but, but wait a minute, what did Jesus say? And then she, they answer, You don't realize what they did to me? Doesn't matter. Jesus said. (laughs) Well, of course I worry. I'm full of anxiety. Because if I don't take care of me, who will? You can justify those emotions, any of those emotions, all the time. But those don't flow from the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Make your attitude the same as that is that which is in Christ. Christ Jesus. Secondarily, submit those things to Jesus, to his mastery. Let me take you to a story in the Gospel of Mark. The men who, had, who were following Jesus, who lived with him day in and day out, had just experienced a whole day of teaching. Now, be honest with me. How many of you would love to sit with a whole day of teaching from the Lord Jesus Christ himself? Come on. Yeah, they'd been with him all day. The story is told in Mark, the fourth chapter. They've been in the presence of Jesus. He's been talking to them about faith life. He showed them. He's been expounding his word. And then the Bible says they came, the day came to a close. And I love this story because it's so relatable. The day comes to a close. And when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, reading from Mark 4, let's go to the other side of the lake. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was into the boat. There were also other boats with him. So far, so good. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped, and Jesus was in the stern asleep on a cushion. Now, if I were writing the story, the next part would be like this. So the disciples gathered hands and began to sing together, thanking God for the stories of faith that they had experienced that day. And they looked on their sleeping Jesus and said, Oh, Father, thank you that he's resting and we trust you to take us through the storm. Yeah, what world do I live in? Here's what the Bible says. Here's what really happened. And the disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up, and he rebuked the wind and waves and said, Quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely quiet. And he said to his disciples, Why? Are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified, and they looked at each other and said, Who is this? Even winds and waves obey him. Those men were in a real storm. And their emotions took over. They lost it. I can hear them screaming at Jesus, because the honest truth is, 
I've screamed at him a time or two in my life too. How about you? When the storm's been blowing and your life's going sideways, everything looks like it's about to be over. It looks like everything is falling in on you. Hey, I was there. Yeah. Seven years ago, right at this time, seven years ago on May 1st, my wife had her first cancer, ovarian cancer surgery. She passed away 24 months later. You want to talk about a storm. (laughs) There were a few days when I walked all by myself in the field saying, don't you care that I'm dying here? That's how we act when our emotions are in control. I'm so thankful that Jesus doesn't reject us then. He holds out his hands and he said, give them to me. Trust me. Trust me. Those disciples experienced something that day. They had heard the teaching. They experienced the promise And it was a story, obviously, that stayed with them, a change moment that stayed with them for the rest of their lives. They're still telling the story in the Gospel of Mark 30 years later. So what about it? You're under pressure. Your emotions are stirred. You're full of worry, doubt, loneliness, envy, jealousy, bitterness. What's going to pop out of you? Well, if they're in charge, not good things. But when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of what's inside of us, we live. If we're filled with the Holy Spirit, there'll be the evidence of the life of the Holy Spirit. There will be love, and there will be joy, and there will be peace, and there will be patience. And people will say, what a remarkable God they serve. Amen? Transformed emotions come from a life in the Holy Spirit. And lastly, and I hurry to close... Transformed emotions come from the truth of, the, of our lives being built on the revealed word of God. Psalm 119.11 says this. You need to memorize this. I memorized it 60 years ago as a kid in Sunday school. It says this. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I'm not going to offend you, Lord, because I've locked your word, the facts, in my emotions. He also says this in, it says this in Psalm 1914. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, the things that I think deep in the seat of my emotions, be pleasing to you, O Lord, because you are, listen, my rock and my redeemer. We need the scripture planted deep inside of us, the truth that transforms our thoughts and emotions. I alluded to that awful stormy time in my life as Bev was leaving this earth. And I'm going to tell you, there were so many times when I had no place to go but to draw on the deep wells of the truth of the Scripture that had been memorized and put in my heart years and years before. Christian, we need that. I close with our series theme today from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Usually I've been starting there. I close here today. Read it with me if you would. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be... Let's try that again. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father... I thank you that you gave us the ability to feel. That you've taught us how to love, how to know both joy and sorrow. I pray. How I pray, Lord, that you would help us to avoid the extremes of emotion. Repressing or indiscriminately expressing. Lord, I pray that when our hearts grow chaotic and wild and messy in the midst of the storms, that we would hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit over the winds and our faith would grow, that we would let you speak peace to us. Teach us, Lord, as Peter directed, to be self-controlled and alert. The Lord of our heart as well as our mind. Fill us anew, I pray, with your spirit. Fill us with the wisdom of your word. 
that we may walk in the life of Jesus, in whose name I pray. As our heads remain bowed, first of all, I want to give an appeal to those of you who are here, those of you who are watching online who know Jesus, but maybe whose life is, has gone a little off the rails. Maybe you're like me a couple of weeks ago, just angry at the world and you don't know exactly why. Commit it to Jesus. Maybe your emotions have gotten dark and you've just almost given up hope on life, sick and tired of the place you find yourself. I know it sounds simplistic, but give that to Jesus. Tell him what you feel and pray for the joy of the Lord to find you. Perhaps you're here and your emotions have been manipulated and you know you're living in sin or disobedience. But it just feels good. It feels right. Confess it. Lord, I know. And in spite of what I feel, it's not a right place, a right choice. Give me courage to change from the inside out by your power. Forgive me my sin. And he will. If you're here and you're listening or listening online and you don't know Jesus in a personal way like I've talked about this morning, oh, you know Jesus is a figure of history, a great teacher, but you don't know him as your Savior, you can make that transition this morning. It's an act of faith. It's a surrender. Lord, I've come to the end of myself. Jesus, be my Lord. Enter my life. Make me new and alive to God. The Bible says that at that moment you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Lord, thank you for your promises. Thank you for your presence. And now, Lord, as we move to communion, I pray that as we take the bread and the cup, that those things will not just be a ritual that we move through, but that the reality of your presence would find us. That, Lord, these, these things would become a means of experiencing anew the precious joy of our salvation. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The Word of God says, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink this cup, or eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But then he gives us this proviso. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. And so a person ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. Let's do that for a moment, and then we'll share together. How I thank you for your grace, Lord. Sometimes yours is a severe mercy. Speak to our hearts. May you find in us, your children, a ready response of confession and obedience so that we can find renewal. Make us holy as we approach this holy table. In the name of Jesus, I pray. The Bible says that he took bread. And when he took that bread, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. God, the incarnate God, willing to be in this world which he had created, subject to the limitations we know, to be broken, to be bruised. Why? That we could be whole. And so we take this bread and we break it and we say, thank you, Jesus, for being for us the bread of life. And as we eat this bread, I pray that somehow we will learn to feed on you 
the strength that you promise, the love that you give. Bless it to our bodies as we eat it in honor of you. In Jesus' name, shall we eat the bread? And then if you're able to stand, I invite you to stand as we take the cup. Don't rush through this, Christian. This cup, the new covenant in my blood. We get sometimes deceived to think that we can somehow be good enough with God, good enough for God, that we can somehow earn our way in. But we don't. He said, I came, died, gave my life, the perfect son of God, so that you, objects of wrath, could be renewed, redeemed, and made beloved children of God. And that is who you are a child of God, saved by God's grace, living in the promise of the covenant that God himself wrote in blood. And so we thank you for this cup. As we drink it, Lord, drive deep into our hearts and into our minds the promise of our salvation. May it be transforming truth, I pray. We love you, Jesus. May this be a cup not only of celebration of your love, but may it be a cup of the celebration of the unity of the body of Christ as we drink it in your name with thanksgiving. Amen. Shall we drink the cup? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So thankful that you are with us this morning. I hope that you will join us for worship again. I look forward to catching you online in the mornings at Coffee Break with the Word. I don't know how many of you check in on that but it's there hope to encourage your hearts through that Monday through Friday here's a good word take it with you this morning oh the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable his judgments his paths are beyond tracing who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor who has ever given to him that God should repay him for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever and ever. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen and amen. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord turn his face Pardon. for you and give you ah.